our life as creative people or as artists or whatever is divided in, into two halves. And the first half, I would say, is our hero's journey. We're basically searching for who we are and what our calling is. And that journey ends when we find out what our calling is and who we really are. And then our world shifts. For the rest of our lives, it becomes about what is my gift? Why did God put me on this planet? How can I give this gift? What is it and how can we deliver it? Government cheese was a punchline when I was in school, you know, because I grew up in the South in Alabama and uh, mostly black neighborhood, actually all black neighborhood. And I think about it, but whoever was receiving government cheese, that was kind of like a, you know, that was a indication that oh, you really? didn't, your well, family didn't have their like stuff together. Term. Uh huh. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. You tease kids about that. So it's uh, interesting yeah. to, uh, to see it in the, in this context. And, uh, and especially the, the reasoning behind it and the metaphor behind it and, and whatnot. But anyway, it's great. It's great to see you again. And I'm looking Likewise. forward to talking about it. Yeah. 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 Talk you, about you, anything you want to talk about. Like, <laughs> well, look, man, you keep, you keep writing these books. I, we, I just had you on the podcast in July for the previous <laughs> book. Yeah. I got but, more uh, coming. <laughs> What about you? Every time I turn around, I get another book from you. So, every time I turn around. well, it's because I read your book. So, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about, I was reflecting about, about, um, you know, okay. So in reading, it, it, this is a memoir, Government Cheese is a memoir. It's your most recent book. And you, you, you tell the, the stories in between the stories that, that you're now, um, you know, you have a huge fan base for reading your self-help work as well as your other uh, fiction and narrative nonfiction work. So one of the stories you tell uh, about working for this trucking company is how you were sort of brought in, your boss brought you in and, and uh, you'd been screwing up a bit and he, he kind of told you, look, this is a job. <laughs> we're all professionals, but you're not acting like a professional. And... Uh, and so I don't know if that was sort of the embers for this whole pro versus amateur thing in your personal life. I think it really was like, you know, it was really one of those, uh, <laughs> thanks. I needed that type moments, you know, that we all yeah. have. Yeah. Uh, where, uh, this was a boss that I really admired that kind of hired me when he didn't need to, you know, as you were a Marine, he took a chance on me when yeah. I was, you know, a real, uh, unskilled, untrained person. And, um, and I screwed up, you know, and I kept screwing up. And I remember he said to me, um, he says, I can see you're working out some stuff, young man, you know? And he says, I don't know what it is and I don't want to know, but just remember you work for me and your job is to deliver loads. And that's, you know, and when, when I give you a load, you, it better appear, you know, where it's supposed to appear. And so that was definitely a real, uh, come to Jesus moment for me that, that I've, uh, you know, that finally got through to me. A lot of people have told, like all of us, you know, our coaches, our fathers have told us that stuff, but a lot of times it doesn't penetrate. That time it did and mm. it stuck with me forever. Um, it reminded me of a time when I, I actually reached out when I was in college, I was an advertising major and I reached out to USA Today, which is in Roslyn, Virginia. And I wanted to just, you know, proactively seek out an internship. It was going to be unpaid. I just said, Hey, I want to come and work with you guys for free. And the guy said, you know, he was impressed with my initiative. And he said, yeah, come on now. And I went out, um, and, and secured the position. And because it was an unpaid position, I took the liberty of showing up whenever I wanted to show up. You know, uh -huh. Uh -huh. I didn't really take it as seriously. And then one day he calls me up and he says, Hey, you know, it's, it's great that you want to be around here and you show up and we're going to need you to get here at a certain, you know, at a predictable time and stay for a certain number of hours and do that on the same day of the week so we can rely on you. And that was, oddly enough, that was actually new information. Like I didn't, I thought because I was volunteering that I could just yeah, they do whatever I wanted to do. Yeah, they should be grateful. Yeah. Here. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and then I realized, no, I have to be professional about this, even though I'm not getting paid because I'm getting paid in something else that's not money. I'm getting yeah. paid in experience, so paid in mentorship. Like it did. That that's the, that was that was my moment 
that you wrote about in yeah. your book that uh, that stuck with me. And, and it's really about your integrity and about your word and, and yeah. things like that. So, you, know, you know who Joe did, did is of the Spartan race? Say the name again. Joe DeSena. D-E-S-E-N-A. Oh, I've heard the name, but I don't, I don't know his story. Oh, really interesting guy. And he did a great uh-huh. podcast with Rich Roll like mm-hmm. maybe a year ago. Very, he started the Spartan race that's now become this big. Okay. And, uh, yeah, no, I know the Spartan about, race. About uh, a similar thing where he had a business cleaning swimming pools when he was a kid. Mm-hmm. And it was in New Jersey. And a bunch of the guys that he worked for were wise guys, mafia guys, you know? And uh, one of them sort of took him under his wing and he said, uh, he said, kid, when you tell me you're going to be here at eight o'clock in the morning, be here at quarter of eight. Mm. And then he also said, and don't ever ask me about money. Don't ever, you know, give me a price that you want. You do the work and I'll give you the money. You know, I'll give you the raise when you're and, uh, you know, that, that was another sort of, uh, come to Jesus moment for him, you know, he kind of mm-hmm. realized, you know, people watch you, your bosses watch you, right? And when they see that you're have your own initiative and your own, you know, self-reinforcement, they love that stuff. You know, I know mm-hmm. I do when mm-hmm. somebody's working with me and I see they're really actually thinking, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and and it makes you want to help. Okay. Yeah, it's such a rare thing to have someone who who thinks about problem solving on a deeper level than just the surface. And you do, you do want to, I've had the same experience with my people working on my team and stuff. You want to figure out ways to keep them incentivized because, you know, it's such a rare talent, you know, and yeah. they, they'll eventually discover their own value and then they'll seek that position that allows them to, to be more creative and to receive the rewards of that. Yeah. It, uh, it, it reminds me beyond that, if I didn't break in on you, like for yeah. somebody like you and me, that are essentially individuals pursuing an individual destiny. Yeah. We have to learn to do that for ourselves, right? Recognize that and, and reinforce that sort of stuff in ourselves, be our own bosses and, you know, write the paycheck to our own selves um, mm-hmm. and kick our own butts when we have to and mm-hmm. give ourselves praise when we have to. That's kind of, the the higher form of that, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So you've been on the show a few times now, and we've talked about your origin story. You've gone really deep to your childhood and all of that. And you just recently released this memoir, uh, or just, yeah, it will be released by the time this episode airs. So it's called Government Cheese. It is a memoir. You've written what? How, this is number 22, 23? Something books? like that. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, half of those books are are self-help books. And then the other half are books uh, that are based in history. Uh, I'm curious if you could, oh, this is, I love hypothetical questions. So indulge uh-huh. me, please. If you could only be known as a self-help author or someone who writes about history and narrative nonfiction, which would you choose if you could only have really one um, Definitely can- canon choose, of books? I would choose the fiction side. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. The fiction and the narrative nonfiction side. Yeah. Because the self help side was almost an accident. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's what you're becoming more and more known for, those self help stuff. I know, which is sort of irritating. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you feel obligated to follow through on these projects that the muse is delivering to you with the self help stuff? Is that how you pay the bills to write your fiction stuff? It, and, and I mean, your spiritual a great, bills. A great question. Like, it's about 50-50, but mm-hmm. I do, uh, I, I'm i interested in that uh, self-help or fiction or nonfiction for my own self, you know? Mm-hmm. It's like uh, about the craft of writing or any creative endeavor, but also the mindset, the mindset of self-discipline and so on and so forth. And I'm interested in that. I'm sort of teaching myself that. So when I have, uh, like, I've got two more books done waiting to, to come. Uh, and, and others coming in all the time. So the, 
it's it's a subject that's interesting to me, but I'm really sort of writing for myself to sort of educate myself. You know how when you write something, you really learn, you know, when you have to actually put it down on words and, and on paper and say and answer the question, what do I really think about this? And what do mm-hmm. I really know about it? So I want to I want to pull the curtain back a little bit for the listener who may be more familiar with your work. Um, you got your own publishing company now, correct? Yeah, I've I've uh, yeah, I've I've actually had a publishing company for the War of Art and other books mm-hmm. like that with mm-hmm. partner Sean Coyne, but uh, that sort of ended about a year ago. So mm-hmm. um, I'm now uh, with my girlfriend Diana Wilburn. We started our own little company. Um, but that's a whole other, a whole other adventure. Yeah. Well, what's the benefit of that? As someone who has such a, such name recognition as you, you imagine you could just walk into say random house or whoever and pitch them your idea for the next book. They give you, you know, six figure, easy six figure, maybe possibly even seven figure advance, you know, and that way you can just focus on the writing as opposed to focusing on setting up shopping carts and, you know, all the, all the little the nuances of, of running your own publishing company. Why start a publishing company now? Well, this may be interesting to people who are listening. And what you just said is not true. I can't walk into Random House. I can't. They don't want it. They don't want my stuff, you know? Or if they do, they want it. They want to put me on the road teaching seminars and stuff like that, which I have no interest in doing with whatsoever. So I know people sometimes think, uh, oh, you might have a name and you can do this and that. But in the real world, you can't. You try to, you know, uh, you knock on doors and a lot of times the doors don't open at all. That, that was a, a part of in your book that I really I thought was really interesting. Um, where you, we get in the Hollywood chapter, right, where you became essentially the hottest writer in all of Hollywood, even though you had been, you know, writing these flops and, and, and the work you were most famous for was a script you didn't even write. You just, you just translated it. <laughs> can you talk, can you talk a little bit about how perception uh, of being success in that industry actually equates to you or, or I should say relates to you trying to maintain your sense of integrity with, Hey, look, I, I want to write good stuff and this other thing I didn't really write it and I don't want to put my name on it and, and all of that and how that sort of shaped you graduating yourself from, from that industry and, and, and really um, doubling down on this other idea you had for the golf book. No, oh, that's a great question. Like it actually, to me, it was fascinating when it happened because it was so counterintuitive and so insane. It's like I wrote two scripts that got kind of uh, made into movies back to back and they were ungodly bad, unreleasable, unwatchable, um, just, just horrible, <laughs> total failures, you know? But when I went to my agent and was sort of ready to kill myself because these things were so bad, he told me, you know, don't you realize you just had two movies made? Nobody's going to see them. They don't care about in the industry. I mean, they don't care. All they know is they see your name next to a title and it's in the Hollywood Reporter. And he said, you don't realize it, but you're the hottest writer in town with these two terrible, terrible movies. And uh, so, and then he immediately, or on another subject, he immediately fired me. But um, so I just thought that that's just crazy the way the world works sometimes, you know? And I thought, I have to focus on what means something to me here? You know, I, I can't be in this game because it's just, it's too crazy. It's interesting though, because you wanted to be a writer. That was like, at that point in time, that was, I would imagine your passion or what you identified as your passion. And you had all of this interest and yet you decided to step away from that to pursue something that did seem as marketable. And I think a lot of creatives particularly may have that same conundrum where you're, you're, you've already sort of gotten away from the conventional life to do this art thing and you could do the marketable thing. Cause you know, if you look at social media these days, all half of the content is like, you're one 
marketing funnel away from becoming a millionaire. You're one Airbnb <laughs> rental arbitrage from becoming a millionaire. All you have to do is this. You you have you financially free. You can do whatever you want to do, and you know, and it's so enticing to a lot of people. And yet, you you decided I'm going to step away. And your agent told you if you leave for a week, you're going to be ancient history. If you leave for a month, you're you're, you're a dinosaur. If you leave for a year, no one is going to give you a meeting again. So yeah. what, what gave you the courage to believe in the idea as much as you did? Cause I don't remember anything up until that point, Like you didn't sit, you didn't have like a Obi-Wan Kenobi figure in your life up until that point to kind of give you the wisdom to do that. How did you know to do that? Well, let me get to the, the real details of this story here. Uh, I had had a, a, like a B-level career as a screenwriter, and I had a, a, a really good agent named Frank. I won't say his last name, and uh, to respect his privacy. And suddenly, I had this idea for a book, not a movie, but a book. And that was with a book that became The Legend of Bagger Vance that then became a movie. But so I went to, and and this idea just kind of seized me, like, you know, you know what it's like, you know, it, it's an idea grabs you and you just have to do it. Even though when I thought about the commercial prospects of it and I was asking myself, is this a good idea? Should I really spend, you know, two years doing this? I thought, absolutely not. This is a really dumb idea. You know, it's not commercial, you know, it's a crazy idea. So I thought, but I was just seized by it. I just had to do it. So when I you know, laid this on my agent. He said, just what you said, I've been working for you for the last seven years trying to get you going. And now if you pull the plug and walk away for a year or two years, you might as well be dead. People forget you in a week and a half. And all my work is going to go down the drain. This is him talking to me. And I knew he was right. But I was just seized by this idea. I just absolutely had to do it. Um, you know, you've, we've talked before, like, you know, I'm a believer in the muse. I believe you get inspiration and when it grabs you, you got to do it. There's just no, no looking back, you know, no matter what you got to do it. But he said something very reasonable. He said, why don't you just do it on the weekends? Why don't you just do it at night? And then you can keep doing the screenplay stuff during the day. So since you already have traction, you work so hard for this. What is it about being seized that made you even reject that? idea because i think that's a very reasonable idea to uh, most people yeah it is reasonable in the realm of reason but writing and any kind of creative work has nothing to do with reason and i just knew if i tried to do it's like if the muse is watching over my shoulder she just gave me this idea and i turn around to her and i say uh how about if i just do this on weekends she's gonna fire me you know she says i just gave you a great idea Sit down and do the goddamn thing and don't be distracted by any other stuff, you know? And, but I just felt that in my bones light at the moment. I just had to do it. I, I had to do it every day and, 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 uh, you know, complete immersion, total commitment. I love it. I mean, did you have the language of the muse at that time in your life or did you, was it just a feeling tone? That uh, no, I did have the, had the language. Yeah. So I definitely <laughs> felt it. Yeah. Great. It was not a feeling tone. It was a real thing. Yeah. Yeah. So that time with Paul, where he introduced you to the prayer and all that, that's where you yeah. sort of became dedicated to By your, the way, your, like, your thank you very much for reading this stuff so thoroughly that we can really have this conversation where you, you know, uh, it, it's, a it's a testament to your professionalism and it also really helps, um, you know, our listeners too. That, thank you. Uh, you know, so thank you for that. I appreciate it. I'm I'm a fan, man. I mean, I, you know, I've, I've devoured all of your other books and this was the kind of book that pulled it all together. And it's interesting um, because you, you reprinted um, a lot of some, some of the stories from your other books and they just like, they pop out, you know, it's like you, you're writing about things that only really a fan would understand uh -huh. the context of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then you have these stories that are a little bit more universally uh, understood uh, because of that context that uh, someone who's read a lot of your work before has had. And I found myself uh, pretty fascinated, but also laughing out. I literally, I, 
this hasn't happened with a book uh, for a very long time where I was laughing out loud. I was in public reading mostly here in Mexico City and I would just burst out, <laughs> even though there were stories I had seen before. But then this, when you get the whole backstory, which is what the memoir really does, it just adds a whole a, a five or six more layers of, of wow. uh, context I I to it. There to see that, right? <laughs> It was, fun. I was, it was, I was a little embarrassing. Actually, I was laughing so much and so uncontrollably. And, um, and it was, you know, I just found it very poignant as, as well. But who, who did you write this book for? I mean, because, you know, writing a book is not a passive thing. It takes time and effort and you have to at least feel like it's, you know, there's a market for this. And, uh, and so, you know, again, you're balancing this idea from the, I, it's the muse giving me this idea, right? So I know I have to do it, but then there's the whole other side, the business side to it, where you, you can't help but think about that a little bit. So as you're writing the narrative, who, who what, who, who's the audience that you have in mind? Oh, that's another great question. People, you know, you know, this like that people who read your stuff or listen to your stuff write into you, you know, I get lots of letters, right? And some of them are really uh, heartbreaking, you know, heartrending, you know. Um, and people will say, you know, thank you so much for your stuff about writing. You know, I would never have finished my book if I hadn't read The War of Art, et cetera, et cetera. And I just thought that that's the that's the person I'm writing for, because the whole point of of the book Government Cheese, the memoir, was to tell the stories that you never tell, you know. To tell, to fill in the blanks between, you know, one anecdote that I might have talked about in the War of Art or another one I might have mentioned in Turning Pro, let's say. But the person who's reading it, as you say, doesn't have the full context. You know, it's sort of like, oh, it's a little story about, uh, you know, when you failed and this and that, right? So I wanted to give people, you know, uh, who are readers of mine, the full story in a way that would encourage them because a lot of that in stuff that the story behind the story is about um, stuff that's completely non-glamorous, a job that you worked at, you know, for 18 months to save money so you could quit and write another, you know, and, and uh, so that if somebody is slaving at their own job for 18 months or whatever to save money, they go, Oh, it's okay. Pressfield did it. That's how he did it. That's how he got from A to B. So it's okay for me to do it. So that's kind of what I wanted to do. I just wanted to encourage people. And uh, that's, that's, that's who I was thinking of as I was, uh, as a reader, as I was writing. So the chapters overall are so, somewhat linear, but within each chapter, you're kind of like going back and forth, hopping around marriage and then the job and then this thing that yeah. happened before. Why? What, what was the thinking behind organizing it in that way? Um, it just sort of naturally flowed. Like the book sort of starts where I get hired as a truck driver. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that as a reader's reading this, they're going, well, where is he coming from? You know, mm -hmm. how did he get to this place? You know, so I felt like, oh, okay, I got to do a little flashback to, you know, my marriage falling apart and then, uh, you know. I'm bouncing around here and there and, and, you know, that's, that sort of thing. So, um, was it tempting to add in some of that sort of self-help stuff, you know, the moral of the story at the end of each chapter or something like that, or, or not, did you have to use no, discipline a, to not really do that? That's a really good question. Like, and actually my whole theory on that is not to do that mm -hmm. um, because I think, and I kind of, uh, I think the reader gets more powerful when that's not there. You know, when you, when you don't actually say, oh, the lesson is this, you know, because I think, you know, the reader gets it, you know, they're smarter than you and I are, you know, they're ahead of us by, you know, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So the story starts at truck driving. It actually ends with that metaphor of the government cheese, which I thought was a really beautiful way to sort of wrap it up. Can you, can you? Can you talk a little bit about that metaphor and what that meant to you as you were as you were writing it? And then I have a couple other follow up questions about it because um, it's a beautiful I metaphor. Remember, uh, you know Larry McMurtry, who wrote Lonesome Dove and Terms of okay. Endearment. And, mm -hmm. 
great Western writer, just died like a few couple of years ago. And uh, he, uh, you know, I think they asked him, you know, how come, you know, he's a very bookish guy, right? He had a big bookstore. And they said, how, how can you write so much about the old West and cowboys and, and cattle drives? And he said, uh, you know, I think of myself as a writer, like I'm herding words across a page, like a cattle driver doing that thing, you know? So, and I always thought, I thought that's great. I never thought of anything that way. So the government cheese metaphor in the book comes from when, uh, as a truck driver, I was delivering surplus food, government cheese and for powdered milk and dried pinto beans and canned peaches and that sort of stuff to poor communities, almost always black communities on the coast in North Carolina. And it was, uh, it was a it was a great experience for me. It really touched my heart in a lot of ways because I was probably making less money than anybody that was getting the actual you know the surplus food. Um, but I felt it was such a satisfying thing to deliver something that was going to go on people's tables. You know, mm. it was going to keep them alive. And so mm -hmm. I felt the metaphor for me as a writer. I felt like as a writer, I'm delivering a load. Remember, I remember we were talking before about my boss saying, your job is to deliver a load, right? And that's kind of, I think, what a, a metaphor for writing for me, that I've, I've got this big truckload of stuff, and hopefully it's sustenance. Hopefully it's going to help people. It's going to give them something. And mm -hmm. my job, I didn't make that stuff, right? I didn't grow it out of the ground. I didn't manufacture it. I'm just the vehicle that's delivering it, you know? And, uh, and the other aspect of that in the book was when you were delivering to these churches and stuff, you would have to be there for like three or four hours while the, the truck was getting unloaded, but nobody ever asked you your name or ever mm. addressed you by name. They always just called you driver and it would be the minister. And he would say to me, you know, driver, would you pull your truck over there and park it and, you know, you can come go inside and have some iced tea or something like that if you like. Um, but it was always drive. And I sort of felt like as a writer, that's very true. It's like uh, the reader doesn't really care who you are or what mm. your name is or anything. They care about the load. They care about what you're unloading and, and giving to them. And I like, I like thinking of myself as anonymous. So that was another... Uh, Another way that it was a it was a metaphor for me, for me, the delivering of the government cheese. Yeah, it also ties back to something I've heard you mention before from the Bhagavad Gita, but how you have the right to the effort yeah. of your work, but not to the fruit of your work. Yeah, that's Krishna, you know, i.e. God talking to Arjuna, the great warrior. You have your right to your labor, but not to the fruits of your labor, which mm -hmm. is a very stoic kind of concept, too, you know. So let's double click on this a little bit, this idea that, you know, you didn't make it. You're just there to deliver it, right? How do you do that? How do you keep your ego? How do you keep your need for validation and that out of your creative process? Because, I mean, it is you having to wake up and, you know, and make the time. And then I mean, you told the story, you know, you, 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 your split with Stanley essentially was because you wanted more recognition more or more money and all of that. And, you know, and, and he wasn't in it for the money. He just wanted the credit. That's all he wanted, you know, but, uh, so everybody has the thing uh, that they want. writing partner that I mm -hmm. had in, in Hollywood, who was, a an older established writer. And I was like the junior member of the team. And, uh, at one point I asked him for more credit and he basically fired me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in terms of keeping the ego out, like in a way, like, like I was saying before about when. The, the idea for the legend of Bagger Vance came to me and it just totally seized me, right? So it was really coming from the muse, coming from another level. It was like, this is the load, right? You're the driver. Here's the load. Deliver it, you know? And so the way that you kind of deliver it as a writer is to take your ego out of it. You know, if your ego is in there at all, that only gets in the way. You're only going to trip over your own feet. So... You, I, I think, uh, you know, Elizabeth Gilbert has talked about this very eloquently in a lot of ways where 
Uh, you have to pull your own need for anything out of the equation and and put yourself at the service of whatever this song or this dance or this book or whatever. I mean, do you feel that way like when you're writing like your book, Travel Light, um, that's coming out soon? Do you feel that you're at the service of that idea or where, how do you, where does your ego blend with that? It's a good question. I, in my process, you know, I'm, I'm still very new. I'm not only four books in. Uh, so what I've noticed in my process is for me, getting my ego out of the way is, is, is surrendering to the idea that I need to be this kind of writer. I need to write like Stephen Pressfield, or I need to write like uh, Robert Greene or these people that, that I really admire. And I'm just going to write like me. I'm just going to tell my story and my voice. And I'm going to understand that this is a process and it's going to get better with each, each go around and, um, and just let it be what it is and not try to control it as much as I was trying to control it initially. So, um, yeah, and just, I guess just understanding that it's, it's, it's about the process and not the outcome, which is something that we all have heard before, it's cliche, but when you have to actually go through it to embody that, you know? Yeah. And I've described the writing process, especially this last book, which is something I really wanted to write, but still, when you get into the, the throes of it, it's, it's kind of like cutting the grass at Central Park with a push <laughs> more and no one else can help you. All they can do is point to areas that you miss. <laughs> You've got to go over and do that. And everyone's out having fun and playing frisbee, and you know <laughs> you're you're over there sweat, you know, with your little push more trying to finish cutting, cutting the grass, and it's going to take a long time. It's going to take you probably six months to to do the whole thing. That's so a great metaphor, like, yeah. So that that was my experience. And then once you, when you're done, you're like, oh my god, I feel so accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> but then it's growing back. You starting to turn around and do the whole thing again. But isn't it interesting that to like. Right in your own voice, you have to take your ego out of it. You would think it would almost be the opposite, but it's not. Yeah. No, it's true. I mean, even with my daily doses of inspiration, which I've, when they first started off, they're really, really long and it's gotten, I'm six plus years into it now. Now they're very uh, pithy and, and, sh and short and yeah. it takes more effort to make them shorter, I've yeah. realized. That it does just keep going on and on and on. Yeah. And so, and a part of that is just getting my ego out of it. I get to go back and take my ego out of it. And I'm getting better and better at that. But it's still hard. It's so hard when you're doing that on a daily basis. So, and I'm, yeah. I'll give you some props. I think that you, you know, I follow you and I read your daily doses every day. And uh, they're very helpful to me. And you do have, you know, a very distinct voice. You know, it, that's yours alone. And uh, so whatever you're doing, keep doing it. But so, okay, so this is my point. Is that my voice or is it the muse's voice being filtered through my life experience? Like, how do you, how do you find that? How do you know, okay, I, this is, I, I'm really capturing the essence of this versus I'm too in my own experience. Is there, is there a way to a determine? Question. I'm not sure what the answer is even at the end. <laughs> I know sometimes I find that when I'm writing in my own voice, like say in the War of Art or something like that, mm -hmm. that on the page, I sound much more confident than I really am, or much more sure of myself and my point than I really am. But yet, when I think about how do I really feel, I really am that sure. I mm -hmm. just sort of have a certain modesty in my real life or a certain insecurity in my real life. But Bottom line, I really am sure about what I want to say. So it, it, it's kind of both. It's kind of the muse's voice, but it's also your voice. So it's the ego that makes you second guess your deepest nature. Yeah. I mean, it must in be favor of what's happening right? externally. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that I've been uh, teaching is that when you ha give yourself the opportunity to drop into your least excited state of awareness. The, the way you know you're there is not because you're sitting there thinking about rainbows and flowers and waterfalls. The way you know you're there is because nothing is happening. <laughs> this is, there's nothingness. And it's, it's that nothingness that is the, the telltale sign that you've merged with some more universal aspect of yourself. 
versus your individuality. So it's your individuality where it's like you and my purpose, me and my friends, me and my partner, me and my experience of love. When you get to that deepest state, it's just one. It's just oneness. And what's beautiful about that is that the more you make contact with that deep state, the more you start to inherently feel that sense of oneness. So, so it becomes more possible to not do someone else harm or to take advantage of someone else because you start to feel that that person is a, is, 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 is a part of you. It, it's, uh-huh. like, it's like you wouldn't take a sledgehammer to your left hand because that, uh-huh. would, that would hurt you. And so you have that same sort of uh, feeling tone about, about relating to other things and other people. So, so that's what I'm a believer, like, like at least was this my understanding of Buddhism, uh-huh. that there really is no personality that we don't, we really don't have a, you know, a thing that's light or a thing that's Steve. I, I, I'm a believer that we, the thing that's light and the, and the thing that's Steve are our, uh, spiritual essences and our spiritual essences actually do have a personality, but that personality is kind of like a ray in the a ray of light from the sun. Like it's all a part of this uh-huh. oneness and it's inherently bright and it's inherently good and it's inherently loving. And so the whole idea of coming to earth and in cor- incarnating in this life is to just, I'm, a, I'm I tend to kind of I adopt the philosophies of like Alan Watts, where it's just, it's about just to live and just to have an experience. And there's certain, there's certain experiences that are going to be more appealing to certain spirits at certain times of their development than other experiences. So some people may want to go and have an experience of this romantic love affair. Someone else may want to become really wealthy. Someone else may want to experience what it's like to be crippled and a beggar on the side of the road. And, and then within all of those experiences are, are spiritual growth opportunities. You know, what is it like to feel compassion for a cripple if I have money? And so you guys make a contract, a sacred contract to cross paths at some point, maybe for a week, maybe for a month, maybe for decades, and to kind of play off of each other. And, and, and you help that person who's crippled you know, learn what it's like to receive and, and the person who has all the money learns what it's like to give. And, you know, and then you play in your next lifetime. Okay. I want to be the cripple. You know, it's, it's, I was watching Breaking Bad. Have you seen this Breaking Bad? Oh yeah. Yeah. I've seen it like a bunch of times. Yeah. I rewatched the whole thing recently with my partner and she had never seen it before. And it was so great to see it again because I also went back and I listened to the podcast the, the, the creators of it made a podcast for every episode. Oh, so you, great. they I gave you the behind the scenes. Ah. Yeah. They give you the behind the scenes. And then I, I was just, I'm such a fanboy. I went in and watched some of the table readings and, you know, these uh, characters really? become so real, but they're characters. And, and it's sometimes easy to forget the fact that they're characters and the better they are, the more intrigued you become and the more drawn you get. You, you get into the story. And I think life is a lot like that. Like spirits are kind of like those characters having the table read before we incarnate and we go uh, into it. Uh-huh. And then we have the full experience and then we come out and it's like, wow, that was amazing. You played that role so amazingly. Uh-huh. I want to do that. I want to have a role like that one day, you know? Ah, that's great. Ah, I mean, I sort of feel like as I was writing Government Cheese and thinking about like, there are seven books in it and each one is named after a mentor to me, right? My truck driving boss and the guy I picked fruit with and that sort of stuff. Interesting. And okay. I, I sometimes wondered, I'm thinking about this because I'm a believer in previous lives and I, I believe, you know, in everything you just said. I wonder in some, in some vibrational way, do we draw those teachers to us or, uh, are they drawn to us to teach us? Because uh, there seems to be some sort of an inevitability uh, uh, about it, even though it's completely random if you looked at it. Um, do, you, do you believe that people are, like in the legend of Bagger Vance, in the story, the legend of Bagger Vance, it's about previous lives. And it's kind of the concept of the book is that we don't, not only do we have lives that we go through, but mm-hmm. we go through them with the same constellation of people that, you know, 
a lover, a friend, or whatever, that we sort of go through them as a group in some mm -hmm. kind of a way. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that, even though I can't prove it in any way. Mm -hmm. Do you think anything like that light? Does that ring a bell with you? You remember the old Bodhi Tree bookstore, right? In Melrose? Oh, yeah. I love that. What a loss that was. <laughs> so I used to go in there and uh, I'm really into the occult and esoteric type of uh, yeah. books. And I got this book called Journey of Souls. Have you heard mm. of Journey of Souls by Dr. Michael Newton? I'm actually reading it right now. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, for the listener, he's, he's someone who, according to his story, he's not around anymore, but according to his story, he was a, a hypnotherapist and he would take people under and he would take them to um, past lives, right? Whether you believe in that or not, it's like whatever. But he did this hundreds, maybe thousands of times. And then one day he took somebody to a place that wasn't a current life and it wasn't a past life. It was some sort of in-between stage. Uh -huh. And so he decided to do it again and again. And then he became very adept at taking people to this life in between lives. And if you read the book, it's just a transcription of his sessions. And if you look yeah. at the questions and the quality of his questions, they were not leading questions. He wasn't like, do you see a light? Uh -huh. Okay, are you floating right now? Uh -huh. You know, he would just say, okay, what do you see now? And what are you experiencing now? And he's found that they were all describing the same relative journey. And he basically mapped out this whole journey of what happens from the moment you leave your current body and until the moment you incarnate in your next body. And so he talks about you go to this soul pod, you go back to your pod where you have your soul class, which are people who are kind of at the same level of development that you're at. And a lot of times you do share lifetimes together and a lot you want to do next? It's like going. It's like you know when you turn on Netflix and you're looking through the movies to see what you want to experience uh -huh. next. You may desire uh, an adventure one night, or a thriller, or a comedy, or whatever the case may be, and then all of your pod mates will start to volunteer for roles. You know, I want to be your parent. I want to be your your child, and <laughs> and so and these roles are there to challenge you to to evolve and grow in whatever ways that you want to do. And then, of course, there's mentors, teachers, people who've done it before and whatnot. So I, I resonated with that when I read that many years ago, and I reread it every few years. And, um, and, and it, the, the way that I sort of uh, decide what I believe and what I don't believe is what I resonate with deep down inside, mm -hmm. uh -huh. right? As a, as a student of meditation and, uh -huh. and all these other spiritual practices. So is that, how is your experience of, journey of soul so far um i'm actually having a bit of a hard time getting into it okay um so I'm, you know i've sort of started it like three different times but uh um i'm determined to, but I've, I've got as much as what you were talking about about pods mm -hmm. and all that sort of stuff and uh but it's it's very interesting to me because i do believe it on some level um, yeah i you know, I don't have like past memories or anything like that, but I do believe there's something there, you know, that, whatever, so, that there's a dimension of reality where all time is simultaneous. And um, even though I don't understand that in this world. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that he says happens right before you incarnate again, is you go through what's called the recognition phase, right? Where you're, sh you're shown certain um, objects or sounds or things that are meant to recall some sort of memory or some sort of desire that you are going to be, um, that that's going to become a, a milestone or a way station for you in your, in your journey. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, people say, I met my wife. Well, when you first laid eyes upon that person, they were wearing a certain charm or they said a certain thing and it got uh -huh. your attention in a certain way. And so that's apparently all a part of this recognition phase, mm -hmm. which has happened so to all of us. That. Yeah. Yeah. It's happened mm -hmm. to all of us. And, uh, and, that, and that was going back to your book, your book, the reason why you decided to pick apples or live in the halfway house or work with, you know, Stanley or leave that, like there were certain things that, that uh, lured you away that maybe you didn't have language for at that time, but there was that feeling tone. And that's certainly been my experience in terms of being on a, a quotes path is 
is being better at following the muse without labeling it, without judging it, without thinking that it needs to lead somewhere that makes you more comfortable. And it's really just about that becomes the game in and of itself is can I take this leap of faith yes. without, without beating myself up yeah. too much? Yeah. Right. And it always so, is a leap of faith. Like even thinking of in writer's terms, whatever the next book is going to be or the next movie or the next project, because you, it's a leap of faith always, right? And almost always I've found my rational mind tells me, this is crazy. Don't do it. But the other mind is saying, you got to do it, you know, even though uh, you have no idea how it's going to come out. And it seems like that's the way the world works and that's the way it should work. And driving a truck is such a beautiful metaphor for this too. You know, you talked about, there's a story about, what was his name? Byron, the guy that was yeah, kind of yeah. mentoring you. So he yeah. was teaching you, he was told to teach you how to take an incline in the truck and you had yeah. to go really fast, faster than you were comfortable going in order to be able to meet the resistance of going, um, going uphill. So I've thought about that in terms of the artistic journey, right? Oh, you know, I never Where, thought about that, like that's, but I like that. That's good. Or you have to, you have to be so all in that it almost scares you, right? Because you, because what's going to happen is, and you talked about this too, um, how your colleague at the ad agency, you know, he had the bestseller right out of the gate. So that sort of enticed you to try it out as well. And, yeah. you know, inspiration, I think is the easy part. But it's when you start to get that uphill incline and you're carrying this load of all these things, hopes, wishes, dreams that you, you want to accomplish <laughs> and things start slowing down that you really need that momentum. Ah, you know, I never thought about that. I, I absolutely agree with that. I think that's great. Yeah. Like, you know, and it scares you and it scares other people. You, when you hit yeah. an uphill in a truck with a big, heavy load, you have to start downshifting really fast because your speed is going to drop and it's dangerous. If you miss a shift, you're in bad shape. You know, you're going to be in first gear going up some, you know, so you have to kind of carry as much speed as possible into an uphill. Um, and like you say, that gets scary because you get really rolling. Yeah. And there was that other story where you're, you didn't, you didn't hook it on correctly and it kind of, yeah. It, it did it turn on its side and you know all this th hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment in the carriage or it just went straight you know, nose uh -huh. first you know it yeah fall over on, on its side yeah it just crashed nose first and you, you 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 sort of gave the anecdote of how Byron came in and helped to jack that up but you thought you had just screwed up completely right and then he just came in step by step helped you to recover that and I think that's another great metaphor for the artistic journey is that when you get that. When you, when you flop, when you get that negative review, you know, you try at your best and, uh, and you think, well, it's all gone to hell now. Well, really it's just about staying process oriented as opposed to being outcome oriented. And this is where mentorship can really help a lot too, because you have people like yourself, people who've, who've been in the arena for a while, taking the blows, who can just tell you, well, you know, that script didn't work, but maybe that one element from that script be a great premise for this other thing that you're, you're working on, or this one aspect to your painting could be a great premise for this other thing and just keep exploring, keep trying. And next thing you know, you're back on the road again. Yeah. 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 The interesting thing about that actual event, when this truck that I was driving, when I dropped this trailer mm -hmm. was, you know, 40,000 pounds of, of load and 20,000 pounds of trailer crashed onto their nose. And it looked like I thought, I'm hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt for this. How am I ever going to pay this back? And this other driver named Byron was sent out to help me. And all he did, he took a few wooden blocks, heavy wooden blocks, and a regular jack, regular tire jack. And he just put it under this trailer, this 40,000 pound trailer. And little by little, he pumped it back up. So the sort of, it was just amazing to me. I thought it was going to need a crane to get this thing up. But it was just one guy with a little jack, and he did it. Mm. So you're right. There's a great metaphor to that, that as bad as some failures seem, somebody that knows what they're doing can set it right mm -hmm. without panicking. You know, just no problem. Here, I'll just do it. Yeah. And speaking of panicking, you said the hardest thing you've ever done in your entire life was happened with that truck. Yeah. Where you get the rewire. Yeah. 
<laughs> which is another metaphor because later on when the guy asked you how to go, you just said, it's okay. It's no problem. <laughs> no. Yeah. It's like, it, it's almost like expecting hardship as a part of that process. And it's not, it's not even worthy talking about, you know, it's, nobody cares. Nobody really cares. All they care yeah. is that, did you deliver the thing? Yeah. Did you do what you yeah. said you were going to do? Yeah. And you shouldn't even really care that much. And that's where I'm getting to with my writing is I don't really, I used to think so much and care so much about what are people going to think, you know, and I'm just like, screw it. I'm just going to send it out. <laughs> and, and, and like you say, start with the next one. Yeah. I mean, it's not like you want to just send it out and you don't care if it's a, no, no. I mean, you do your best, goal. you do your absolutely best to solve then the problem on to the next one, you know, which is another law of life, you know, that, uh, you know, there's another trolley coming down the track and you've got to get on it. Mm. So I heard you on Rogan, you talked about how, or maybe it was Tim Ferriss, I don't remember, but you talked about how, you know, there's all this talk about the hero's journey and eventually you have to shift to the artist's journey. And, and that's where your life actually becomes more boring, <laughs> which, which again is a little bit counterintuitive. So can you just talk a little bit about that concept? Um, I, I feel like, our life as creative people or as artists or whatever is divided in, into two halves. And the first half, I would say, is our hero's journey, which is when, which is really what government cheese is about, when we're walking into walls and falling off of cliffs, and we're basically searching for who we are and what our calling is. And that hero's journey, that journey ends when we, when we find out what our calling is and who we really are. Like we say, okay, I'm a dancer. You know, I don't care what happens. I'm going to dance, you know, and then our world shifts and becomes, and then for the rest of our lives, it becomes about, okay, what kind of dancer am I? What is my gift? Why did God put me on this planet? And how can I uh, deliver that load? How can I give this gift? And so if you're a writer, you're now you're now all about becoming, honing your instrument, you know, your, your, your self-discipline, your ability to surrender to the muse, your ability to trust yourself, your ability to endure rejection and failure, and then just the craft itself. How do I, you know, how is a story told? That kind of thing. And so when I say that half of your life becomes boring, on the outside, it looks boring. Like if we watch Twyla Tharp, the great choreographer, she gets up in the morning, she goes to the gym, then she goes to her studio. She's there all day, you know, you know, working on the dance, and then she goes home. So it seems boring from the outside, but from the inside, the works that she's chore choreographing, that's exciting. That's where she's being really brave and going into areas she's never gone in before. And all of the stuff, bringing everything to it, trusting her instincts, that kind of thing, and her skills, the failures she's had in the past, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what I, I would call the artist's journey. First the hero's journey, then the artist's journey. And the artist's journey is about our gift. What is it and how can we, how can we deliver it? Mm. So we're not monks, Steve, right? And we have partners sometimes, and maybe the partner's are not exactly yeah. on the same kind of path. So how do you how do you how do you suggest we negotiate that as people who are on this very specific journey? Because you know, having these boring existences, but we're really passionate about our work, doesn't always work in a relationship context. Yeah, it's it is kind of tough in a relationship context because, and I've certainly had relationships where um, the person I was with couldn't take it, couldn't take the way I lived. You know, um, and I understand that, you know, um, you know, they maybe wanted to go to Cancun or go out at parties and stuff like that. And I would just have to say, you know, I just don't care about that. I'm not going to do that. Um, so, yeah, it does get complicated. Who, who, uh, it takes a special type of person to line up with somebody that's on an artistic journey. And usually mm -hmm. it's another person that's on their own artistic journey. Like I think a little bit about uh, Joan Didion and uh, her husband, John Gregory Dunn. And they were both writers and they actually collaborated on a bunch of screenplays. 
in addition to you know the individual works that they did and apparently it it worked um but it's it, it's certainly a tricky thing you have a partner that's very much you know on your team and and supportive and behind the scenes diana yeah and in your definitely. in your in your dedication you said diana willed this book into being so well, what do you mean by that? Because you're the resistance guy. You're overcome resistance guy. So what do you, what do you mean she had, she willed the book into me? Well, we're talking about government cheese, right? And yeah, yeah, government he, cheese. I have, of course, you know, we're we're a couple. We're together. So I've told her a lot of my stories, you know, mm -hmm. the things we're talking about here. And she just said to me, you shouldn't write these down. You know, this should go. And so I immediately said, oh, who's going to care about that? That's a really, you know, everybody's got a million stories. It's all boring. Why should I do it? You know? But she said, no, 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 people will really care about this and so on and so forth. So she was the one who sort of willed this book into existence. Now, at the same time, she's a writer, too. And she has a bunch of books that are kind of in the oven of our own. And so part of our relationship, from my point of view, is me trying to, to, be, to, to help produce the fertile ground that her stuff can grow in, you know? And she can mm. overcome her resistance and, uh, you know, and bring her gift out. So I imagine you have that, that internal conversation with every book, right? Like who's going to care? Well, I've already done this. Exactly. It's the voice um, of resistance. So what made this time any different? And can the muse come through other people? Is that, was that one of the, one of the ways the muse likes to communicate? Um, I think the muse does communicate sometimes to other people. I've, I've had that happen before. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, this particular book, um, took a long time to find traction. You know, mm -hmm. I probably was working on it for nine months, you know, where I was still racked by self doubt all the way through, you know, is this any good? Is anybody going to care about this? Or am I just indulging myself? Am I an idiot? And then finally, I just sort of felt like, Maybe I am an idiot. Maybe I am indulging myself, but I'm going to go for it anyway. I don't care. No, though. I mean, nine months is, again, it's not passive. It's a significant amount of time to, yeah, to not even know. Of it. Yeah. To, to not even know that I'm, I'm following my muse or is this just I'm just indulging? Like, and you've been doing this forever, man. I mean, you, you wrote the book about it. So how, do you, how does someone out there who's, who's only, who's had, hadn't even written their first thing yeah, how do they know? Am I just being self indulgent, or is this something you just have to do it? That's, that's a great question, right? And I do think that when I look back, you know, when you finish a book, you always, for me at least, I forget about it. Mm -hmm. I forget how hard it was. Yeah. It's sort of like flying to Australia, right? You think, oh, I forgot how hard it was. Um, but then uh, working on this book, I sort of flashed back to other earlier ones. And I thought, you know, they were really hard too. And I went through long periods of self-doubt. And um, I think that's just part of the process. Um, my friend Victoria Labalm wrote a book, which I have here, on this subject called Risk Forward. And mm -hmm. it's exactly about that subject. It's about the period of self-doubt that you have and how it's, it's a skill that you have to develop of keeping going, even in the midst of self-doubt. And um, it's what Keats called negative capability, to be able to hold two ideas in your mind at the same time, that this might not work or this might work. And I'm just going to go forward and, and ignore the one and hope that the other one's right. Did you hit a point where you decided, okay, this is, this does need to happen and I'm going to put it yeah. out and I'm yeah. going to take this more, take it to it the next happen, level. I've found in books where maybe you get a third of the way through and you say to yourself, I could be wrong. Maybe this isn't going to work, but I like it. You know, if I were a reader and I were reading this, I'd want to keep reading. So mm -hmm. then, then I think you do really get with the program and self-doubt goes away. So to go drilling a little deeper into the process, your process, having been, you know, you're a veteran in this, something I did differently with my previous book was I actually, there are these, um, uh, audio, uh, dictation 
mechanisms on the on on the word processing software wow. now. So it'll Price. read it to you. Yeah. Huh? No, no, it'll read it back to you. Oh, oh. So I actually listened to my book read back to me without read because normally you read draft after draft after draft, and then I decided to just listen to a draft, and it was different quality of experience in reading it. And yeah. uh, I would bet, and, yeah. And I'm I'm curious, you edited your own book, so uh, I think you edited. Like, did, did that help you? Oh yeah, tremendously, tremendously, because. A, a lot of people, myself included, are experiencing books as audio books these days. Yeah, uh -huh, so yeah. you want it to sound, you know, relatively yeah. conversational so that yeah. it's easy for the listener to follow. But B, it just, I wanted to also make sure it was in my voice. And, uh, and so in your final stages of preparing this book for the public, what are some of the things that you do um, that helps you to, do you, do you have a couple of friends that, read your manuscripts or what, what, are, what are some of your, um, your habits when it comes to preparing the book to, for birth? I, I, one thing, I don't do anything audio. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't read it myself. I don't have anybody read it to me or anything like that. I'm not sure why. I just, I guess I, I know a lot of people listen to books, but I'm old school. And so I'm just, I want it. I judge it at, by how it looks on the page. And, um, you know, uh, I, I used to, when I was working with my dear friend and editor, Sean Coyne, he, I would, he would be my, my feedback. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely listened to him as if it was the voice of God, you know, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, but this, this last book, I just had to do myself. So all I did was just try to put my, sometimes what I'll do is I'll think of um, a friend or somebody that I know, and I'll say, what would they think as they're reading this book? And I'll kind of put myself in their, in their head, and, uh, and I'll read it that way. And that helps me sometimes. Do you think that taking advice from other people is a betrayal of the muse when it comes to artistic expression? Like, should you just experience this for yourself or should you seek out outside opinions on hey what do you think about this does it do you connect with it or or a little bit of both uh that that's another great question i think that 99 percent of people including other artists or writers don't know what they're talking about and can't evaluate something correctly so and they will steer you wrong. Um, but if you can find that 0.1%, that <laughs> one person or those two people, then you've got solid gold and you got to hang on to them for everything they're worth. But it's, a, it's very hard. It's, you know, Stanley, my writing partner, used to say, it's very, very hard to know what's wrong with something when you read it. But it's even harder to know how to fix what's wrong. And very, very, very few people have that skill. I think it's, it's almost an instinct. Um, so I do think you can really go. I'm very much opposed to having bunches of people read your stuff, particularly untrained people, but even trained people, because it's just so hard. Uh, and so, and I myself, if somebody asks me to read something for them, I'll just recuse myself. I'll disqualify myself because I know I'm not really good at that. I, I haven't got that gift. What I will tell people if I, if, if I read anything is I'll tell them, now, if I were doing this, this is how I would do it. And, of course, that completely screws them up. That's like the last thing in the world they want to know. And the last thing in the world you should say because what you really want is what they would do, not what you would do. So it, yeah, so I would, I'm definitely not a, like, I'm not a believer in writers groups or anything like that. I mean, maybe it works for somebody else, but I would never show something I was working on to, you know, amateur writers, forget it. No way. I mean, yeah, that's such, professionals. Yeah. I wouldn't show it. Um, I didn't show any of my manuscripts to anyone 
before yeah. I, before they published. I was just well, listening to it for me, for my own personal satisfaction. And it's like, uh, okay, that's that's good. Well, it's working. Like whatever you're doing, it's working. <laughs> But, you know, your relationship with Stanley was such a fascinating, I think, example of the mentor-mentee relationship. And I would love to, for you to just talk about that a little bit more for the listener and how it worked, right? Where you guys had a certain time you, were, you schedule, but then he would show up four or five hours later and, and how that all kind of, well, why that dynam- dynamic was worked for you for that time in your life. Uh. Well, I, uh, when I got teamed up by my agent at the time with a, an older established writer in Hollywood who had had, you know, a couple of big, big hits and he was a brand, you know. And so for the first time in my life, being a, the junior member of this team, I actually was working. You know, we would go into meetings and, and Stanley was the brand and people wanted to work with him. So when we first started working together, uh, he said, OK, well, work over your place. I'll be there at 930. And uh, so the first day he showed up at 1.30. The second day he showed up at 2.30. And then three, you know, and finally, after like six weeks of this thing, I, I, I said uh, to myself, Steve, just start. Don't wait for him to get here. Just start. So I did the next day. You know, I banged out like six or seven pages. And when he got there, we went over the pages. And he had a lot of good ideas. And I realized that that was what he wanted all along that he wasn't really a writer writer in the sense that he could sit down and write a scene. He was a producer writer. And so he was the kind of guy who could, I could give him 10 ideas about a scene and he would reject nine of them, but he would pick the one that was right. And so that was a great mentor situation for me or mentee situation because I would keep asking myself, why did he pick that one? You know, how come I can't pick that one? And um, that was a great, he just had that, that gift. He knew it when he saw it. And he also could bring the good stuff to himself. He'd have great ideas as well. Um, but uh, and he would never literally sit down and teach me anything. But uh, he would just, I just watched the way he thought and what movies he liked, what stories he liked, what he thought... He was one of those guys who could tell you what was wrong with something. Mm-hmm. And he could tell you how to fix it. So he had that rare gift. He was that one in 10,000 could do that. And you learn from that just by watching. Right? You're just constantly asking yourself, how did he pick that one you know, kernel out of all of those others? And um, it's great to watch when you see it happen. Yeah, I mean, when you're around these people, and I've been around people like this as well, um, Part of you makes you think, you know, I need to be around this person all the time because I, 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 the more I'm around them, the more I realize I don't know. So how do you know when it's time? I mean, your exit was a little bit more, like you said, he dumped you. How do you know it's time to graduate yourself from that sort of mentor relationship and uh, move off and be on your own? You know, I never even thought about this till I was actually writing this book. And I realized that uh, there, were, there were a couple of times when I was working with Stanley where I had ideas of my own for screenplays. Mm-hmm. And I didn't tell him about them. I just went ahead and wrote them. And that was great a great experience for me, too, because I felt like, oh, I'm not completely dependent on him to tell me what's good and what's not good. And, and then other times, there are moments where you disagree. And you say to yourself, you know what? And you think about it. First, he has a strong point of view, and you say, okay, I have to yield to him because he's the master, you know? And then you go away and you think about it. You go, no, you know what? He's wrong. That's not what we should be doing. And that really gives you a lot of confidence because you go, ah, okay. You know, I, I can have ideas myself that are worth, I'm not dependent on him completely. Um, and, and, uh, and you do sort of, you know, find yourself doing, doing things that he taught you and that work. And you go, oh, I've really learned something from him here. This is a skill I can use myself. I don't have to depend on him to be there and watch me. Mm-hmm. What did you What did you take from that experience with Stanley to incorporate into your Bagger Vance, the golf novel that no one thought was going to work? That's another great question, Light. And this is really interesting. I haven't even thought about this, so you just asked me that. I think talking about the hero's journey mm-hmm. and the artist's journey, like we were talking before, when the idea for The Legend of Bagger Vance came to me to write as a book, 
I think for the first time in my life, the muse was really dictating something to me. And I just followed her. I really, maybe I was bringing certain skills of uh, organization and reinforcement and stuff like that, but I wasn't really taking um, writing lessons from the past. This was a whole new ball game all of a sudden. And, and a whole different voice and a whole different process that was happening. And it was a really a blessed process. So in the Breaking Bad uh, recaps, people, they talked about how, you know, they, people would ask them, did you, did you think this was going to become what it, it ended up becoming? And obviously they all said, no, we didn't think so. But there was okay. something about it that, you know, resonated. And then, of course, as, it, as the seasons continued, they started to become more popular and uh, and then it just became this huge sensation. So was there something in your process of creating Bagger Vance that made you feel this is something special that I'm doing? And uh, and or after you completed the process, was there something different about that versus any of those other sort of backward things you were doing in Hollywood where you write a flop and then, it, you know, you become the hottest writer in town as a result of that? I mean, you must have been completely turned upside down, you know, coming out of that experience. Yeah, it. It did feel special, light, but, but, and this is a big but, it felt special to me. I thought, oh, I'm really onto something here. But at the same time, I thought, but the world, the commercial world, they're not going to have any interest in this at all. I never thought, oh, this is a hit. Not at all. But I just thought, wherever this voice is coming from, this is a pure voice, and I have to stay with it. But I, mm -hmm. but I, I never thought that it would be successful. That, that was a surprise. Do you think serendipity is something that follows working for the muse? That if you do what you're supposed to do, then usually the way things sort of connect, the dots connect, is through some sort of serendipitous... Um, I do. I do. I feel like, I feel like uh, the muse is floating above us, looking down on us, and watching our long process... You know, as we're trying to 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 serve her or find her, and I think uh, she sort of says, "No, not yet, not yet." You know, the guy's okay or the gal's okay, but not yet. And then finally, at some point, I think she says, "Okay, all right." She he has suffered enough and been been true enough, um, you know, in his dedication or her dedication. I'm gonna I'm gonna give I'm gonna give him something. Yeah, because you couldn't have planned that, you know. I mean, you were in oh, Hollywood. No, you never met Robert planned. Redford. But then you go through your literary agent who ends up connecting you with this, you know, producer who knows Robert Redford. And then they end up firing you from your own project, which, again, it's not anything new to you. But you actually were really grateful this time you got fired. Why, why were you grateful? Well, in, in the movie business, as I know you know, the original writer of anything, if it's a novel or if it's an original screenplay, immediately gets fired as soon as they, you know, which I can understand because film is a director's medium and it's not a writer's medium. You know, television might be a writer's medium, medium or a showrunner's medium, but film is not. And as soon as the director comes on board, in this case, it was Robert Redford, it's his movie. You know, he wants to make it his own way. And he doesn't want you, the pain in the ass writer, telling him, you know, oh, I didn't see that scene that way, you know. So <laughs> he immediately gets rid of it. But in my unceremoniously, mostly, right? Unceremoniously. Like in my experience prior to that, no one had ever told me I was fired. I would have to read about it in a paper. You know. <laughs> so in this case, the, the producer, a great guy named Jake Eberts, who won Best Picture Oscars for Gandhi, Chariots of Fire, Dances with Wolves, and one other one that I'm forgetting. He phoned me up. And uh, he's a Canadian and a really sweet, nice guy. And he said, I feel so bad to tell you, Steve, but you know, you're off the project. And I thanked him profusely because I said, I said, Jake, this is the first time anyone has ever had the actual guts and decency to actually fire me in person, or at least over the phone. So I was really grateful that for that, you know. So I have a technical question, again, just as a writer and a fan. 
um, when someone writes a memoir and you, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're a young man, but you're, you're not, uh, you've been on, you've been around for a while. You've been around the block a few times. How do you recall such detail from your past? Have you been keeping journals for years and years and years of these little details or uh, what's the, what's the secret to that? Question, like, and I was reading Beryl Markham's book, West with the Night. Have you ever heard of that or read it? No, no. Beryl Markham was a woman. And she was like the first woman to fly from Europe to America, kind of like Charles Lindbergh, you know, but in reverse. And it's called West with the Night because somehow she had to fly at night because that way the sun would have come up when she landed in Boston or something. She wound mm-hmm. up like crash landing in Nova Scotia. <laughs> but I'm, I'm reading her book and she's describing the flight. And mm-hmm. she's talking about... I looked at the air pressure gauge, you know, the water pressure gauge and it's <laughs> right. from 47 to 31. And I thought to myself, there's no way she could remember that, you know? So I realized that it was okay to sort of fictionalize a little bit, you know, mm-hmm. to bring in the details just like you would if you were writing it in fiction because you're mm-hmm. being true to a real event. So the bottom line is some of those things, are, some of them I completely forgot, but the ones that that I did remember, um, I would make up some of the details be, because uh, you know I thought it was legitimate, you know. If but I didn't know I didn't have any notes or anything like that. In that fact, was this one weird of- kind of like there were some moments. This happened more than once where I'd I'd be wanting to tell a story and I'd say, "What year did that happen? Was it before?" <laughs> you know, right. Like, well, and I couldn't remember. I don't know, where, where was I? What happened? I don't know. Yeah. That's what I would imagine. That's how I would imagine it would go. I just wasn't sure if we were able to yeah, tap no, into I some secret memory database that I didn't have access to. But uh, that was one of the moments in your book that made me laugh out loud when you talked about how you got to this point in your own career where you decided, I'm going to stop trying to personalize all my characters and base them on people that I know and, and, and myself. And I'm just going to start writing complete fiction. And then you wrote this prison story and people thought it was so real. People thought you do, they would come up to you and go, Steve, when did you do, when did you do time? (laughs) And you had made it all up. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, it's like a funny moment, but there's a real truth to it. That's sort of when you write fiction, it seems realer than when you're actually telling the truth of something that actually happened. Don't ask me why, but, uh, well, I do know why. It's because the muse comes in. When mm. you're writing fiction, you're pulling it out of, you know, the place where the sun don't shine, you know? Mm. And, and uh, somehow that's realer than real. Is there a different mindset or... or, or oh, or yeah. Aspect of your, yourself as a writer that you have to drop into to write fiction versus the self-help stuff? Uh, oh, yeah. Very mm. different, you know? Um, it's... Uh, you know, it's like I sort of le- liken it to like, let's say when you're a little kid, you're six years old or seven years old, and your mom or the school principal catches you, you know, putting cherry bombs in the in the in the toilets, you know, and you're on the spot in front of the principal, and all of a sudden you hear yourself like coming up with this incredibly elaborate story that's you know an excuse, you know. Well, I was actually in there, you know, uh, Father, I was praying. I was actually praying. I was praying. I thought, you know, I could reach God more if I had an explosion. So that was, you know. And so that's the sort of place that your mind goes to when you're making up a story, when you're making up fiction, um, mm. which is the fun of, you know, that mm-hmm. uh, you're just winging it, but it's coming from another place, right? It's coming from the muse. Somehow, it's like having a mob on stage, right? Not I've right. never done that, but I'm sure that's exactly what it's like. You just you hear your voice saying something, and it says something else, and you don't know where it's coming from. So Tim Ferriss talks about how you inspired him to create these fictional stories, and uh, and having been on both sides of that, do you do you do you uh, recommend that someone who is a sort of nonfiction self help writer experiment with the other side and vice versa someone who only writes fiction experiments with the other side if it resonates like how do you how do you think about that as a creative yeah i i don't know about that light uh 
I would only say if if some if if somebody was really drawn to tying the other side, go ahead and do mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't give anybody advice to do that. <laughs> What's the best advice you've ever received, Steve? Um, just uh, keep working, keep going, no matter what, keep going. There was, I, I think this is actually part of government cheese. A, a director that I worked for named Ernie Pintoff. Mm-hmm. Um, that was his advice to me, and I thought it was just great advice. When I was just a, just starting out, and you know, having only these little crappy jobs like slasher movies and stuff like that, and he just said, you know, keep working because you're mm-hmm. going to get better. Porn scripts, uh, any commercials, Don't anything. Don't turn up your nose at anything. You know, the people you meet, somebody that's schlepping coffee on this movie set might be a producer three years from now and they'll hire you. So just keep working. Don't be precious. You know, keep digging the ditch. Great advice. You've you've had bestsellers. You've had uh, movies turned into film. I mean, books turned into films. You've you've been on all the biggest podcasts and had you know, glorious New York Times reviews. <laughs> so, and you have two books in the can. So what is it? What is it that inspires you as a, as a creative these days versus maybe 20 years ago, you know, when, when you're, um, maybe 15, 15 years ago when art, when the war of art gates of fire and all these books were, were sort of in, creation well i you know it's a great exercise to sometimes i think to look at somebody like say bruce springsteen's albums in a list look at all them together bob dylan's album Joni mitchell's anybody snoop dogg's albums or whatever it is and see how you know one follows the other and yet they're they're all in uh they're it's a unity you know, a Bruce Springsteen album is a Bruce Springsteen album. It's nobody else's, right? Or, you know, any writer, a Saul Bellow book, a Hemingway book, whatever. Um, and I feel like uh, I have a series of works that the muse is going to give me, uh, you know, like assignments. Or if we go back to the trucking metaphor, it's another load, right? You call into the terminal. Okay, pick up this trailer so and so and deliver it somewhere else. And as long as I'm getting those phone calls, I'm going to respond to them and do them. So that's that's what keeps me going. Beautiful. My life is really project to project, and I'm completely immersed in one. And then when it's over, I go on to the next one. So you said you have two in the can, ready to ready for for release. Uh, yeah. When are those going to come out? Um, I don't know, maybe next year sometime. This is sort of a COVID thing, you know, when COVID was going on big time. Of course, I just had it last week. I just got out of it, you know, two days ago. But um, uh, you couldn't really do anything in terms of like, you know, publishing or bringing things out. So I just sort of wrote a few things, you know, and put them in the, in a, you know, just a file on my computer waiting for the time to bring them out. Do you, do you have, as a, as a writer, do you have like a, I want to do one a year or is there any kind of schedule like that where you, no, you haven't released something in a while? I've, I'm a servant of the muse, whatever she wants me to do. You know, one of something upcoming might take four years. Mm-hmm. Another thing might just take a month and a half. So whatever, whatever, uh, she wants me to do. Are you working on a, another one now? Like a yeah. new one? Yeah. Um, I'm working on, uh, without getting into too much detail, this was my last yep. fiction book. It's called Man at Arms. Arms and mm-hmm. It's about a, a recurring character that I have. Telemon of Arcadia. Yes. Yeah. A, the <laughs> one-man killing machine of the ancient world. And so mm-hmm. I'm doing a follow-up to that book. I'm doing another uh, thing about his life, what, he, what happens to him. Love it. Beautiful, man. Well, I'm happy to, uh, again, have you back on the show and hear more about your process and uh and i was grateful to receive an advanced copy of government cheese i think people are really going to enjoy it especially your fans i think they're really going to enjoy it and uh happy to be able to call you a friend hey light it's great to be on your show and great to hang out with you and like i say thank you so much for doing the preparation 
um, so that you know we can really get into the weeds on this because I think not only is it fun for me, but I think it's it's really um, profitable for our listeners. You know that uh, that you've done you've really done the work. You know, God bless you, and, well, and all of your work. You know, keep it going. Whatever you're doing, keep doing it. Thanks. It's an honor. You make it easy because it's such fun to read your stories. So, so thank you very much, man. Right, we'll see you lot, again right? soon. It's a real pleasure to call you my friend. Absolutely. If you like that video, you're going to love the next one. Click this thumbnail right here and I'll see you over there.